I was shocked by how blatantly against religion some people seemed to be. I never met my dad. He left me, he abandoned me, and that, that crushed my life. I didn't pay attention to church. It was a routine. It was my family saying I need to go to church. The temptations are still there, and it is hard to say no. It really is. I realized that I found myself being really passive in my faith. No one was calling me to a higher standard. There's always that part of your conscience that says, you know, go ahead and keep doing it, keep doing it. There ain't nothing wrong with it. You always want to be cool. You always want to be the, some of that part of that popular crowd. I don't even think some of my friends growing up knew I was even a Christian. I knew that I was doing the wrong thing. I was drinking on the weekends and then showing up at Bible study, and I was keeping up two different images. You spend your whole life fooling everyone. Th everyone thinks you're this great Christian, but then when you face God, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. I should resemble Jesus in the way I act, the way I talk, and, and Jesus never fit in. Jesus says you should actually be happy when someone puts you down for following me. God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. As courageous as we want to be, there will be those times when we mess up. And the last thing you want to do is distance yourself from God. I mean, that's what the word encourage means. It's like giving courage to someone else to be willing to stand for Jesus. Even if the entire planet is against you, courage stands strong, even if it stands alone. Well, I forgot to let the children be dismissed, so if that hasn't happened, by all means, our children's ministry will take and pour into our little ones. Let me ask you, oh, this gets a little heavy, kind of gets in the way. Have you spent any time being persecuted? Have you spent any time having difficulties in your life because of who you are? Do you know what it is? to have technical problems when you wish you didn't. A ringing in your ear. This week we're going to take a look at what it is to suffer for Christ. The attitude that we have as we go through the difficulties of life. And I pray, I'll tell you on the front side before we're done today, that you'll walk out of here different than how you came in. Because I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who say that they're speaking for Christ who don't want to talk about the need to carry a cross, who avoid the parts of the Bible that speak directly to the attitude that we should have as we walk with the King. And I want to ask you now, as I try to find a spot for this... Where's your cross in your life? Do you try to hide it? Do you try to avoid it? Do you carry it with you? We'll, we'll see how this goes. The question is, what are you going to do when hard times come? As that little clip shows, we need to have a courage that says, no matter what. And this morning, as we look now in week number five of a series we've entitled, Faithfully Fight to the Finish, as we go through Second Timothy, not looking at some church's mandate or some denominational stand, but God's word. I want to remind you where we've been as we, this morning, look at verses 8 through 12 of Second Timothy chapter 1. We see Paul has introduced himself as a radically transformed man who has a passionate and personal relationship with young Timothy, one who he considers to be a son of his in the faith, a protege, if you will. Last week, we saw where he's telling Timothy, I remember you in my prayers constantly, night and day. Man, I love you. I love you. The fact that I know that you have a sincere faith. And we saw that biblically the word that we see as sincere literally is two words put together in the Greek and it means non-hypocritical. He says, I love the fact that you're the real deal. That you have a non-hypocritical faith. And he went on and he said, now, Timothy, I know you're a little bit younger than most, and sometimes that bothers you. You get a little nervous. I know that you're dealing with storms and heat and struggle unlike most people will ever know. But remember this, you have not been given a spirit of timidity. 
And that word we saw was a shameful, cowardice fear. Paul says, oh no, you have the very Holy Spirit of God in you. You have God's power, God's love, and God's self-control in you. Consequently, that means you have no excuses. There are no excuses for a child of God. You have resurrection power to win. You have the cross's sacrificial love to address the want to. And you have the great administrator, the Holy Spirit, to take care of the steps of your walk. So you can be, and you have been called to be, a champion for Christ. No chumps allowed in the real church. The ecclesia, the called out people of God. No cowards in the pool of Christianity. Say, Pastor Jeff, here you go, heavy-handed, right from the start. Let's go into God's Word. Lest you think that I'm giving you some kind of a pep talk. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy as we now look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. And I want to warn you up front, I've brought some friends. We're going to do some teaching today. And I've brought some friends because it's important that you realize that you're not getting one person's bent on these things. This is God's truth, His way. God's word says, so, or therefore, do not be ashamed. The question is, will we have the courage to stand? When the walls of the world come caving in, when the pressure is applied, young people, to you at school, that being a Christian is not cool, that your standing up for what God stands up for is going to cost you friends, social circles. You're going to take some heat when you stand up for the king. God's word says, do not be ashamed. Remember, you have the power of God, the love of God, and the self-control of God. Therefore, do not be ashamed. We took communion this morning, and I asked you as you took the broken body of Christ and the blood of Christ symbolically in the bread and the juice, can you take that remembering what happened on Good Friday, and can you stand? Head up, heart pounding. Fingertips extended in love? Or do you find under the weight of the world that it's easier to be ashamed and put our head down? And maybe I don't run away, but I walk away. Maybe I don't fall down, but I turn my back. Paul says clearly here, do not be ashamed. To testify about our Lord I want to ask you this morning, when you testify, when you share who Jesus is, when you share what the gospel, the gospel is, are you ashamed of half of it? I want to ask you, it's very comfortable to let people know that Jesus loves them. Do you let them know that he's a holy God, that he doesn't wink at sin, and that unless you're willing to pick up your cross daily and follow him, that he says you're not worthy to be his disciple? Do you testify in the fullness of God's word? Or are you ashamed of some of the truth? I have had times in my life where I have been ashamed. God, forgive me. But I saw a circle of people and I thought, I don't know if they're ready for that. And that was a lie because that was me covering up for myself because I wasn't ready to go and be who I was called to be at that time. I want you to think about, I'm going to introduce you to another piece from Francis Chan. Do you take God's word as God's word in the fullness and share it? Or do you carve out the parts that you think might lead to friction? Do you embrace the fluff and leave out the parts that require faith? I think Francis has done a great job of putting this in a perspective that I think will stick with you for a long time. It has me. Take a look at this. And the, the, the arguments I've had where, where uh, you, you know, people have said, you know, uh, one guy, been in my church for like 15 years, ever since it started. I thought I was one of the key guys. And, and he comes to me, you know, just, just not too long ago. And he goes, y you know, Francis, here's the problem with you. He goes, you think everyone needs to be this radical. You, you think that Jesus calls us all to be radicals. 
He, he, goes, he goes, you know, you, you think there's just these, these few radicals. And, and, and he goes, you know, there's this, you got to understand, there's, there's this middle road where, where, you know, people, you know, they profess Christ and they do some good things. And it's like you're, 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 you're neglecting that whole middle road. Did you guys know that? There's a narrow road that leads to life. There's a wide road that leads to destruction. And now there's this new middle road. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. Like a carpool lane. You, you, it's just this, this weird new road we created where you can just do some good things in the name of Jesus and still hold. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it, you know you just go, you're serious right now. You're dead serious. You found a middle road. I, I, you guys, I, I, I'm not a real, you got to understand, those who know me know that I'm not a real complicated guy. I, I, I tend to think like a kid. I tend to just go, wow, that seems like what it says. You know, I, I, I remember when, uh, when I was a kid, we used to play this game called Follow the Leader. Remember that? I mean, some of you guys don't because you just played video games. And you, 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 but... We used to play this game called Follow the Leader, where the leader, you know, flaps his wings, and you do the same thing, and it was easy. You, you just do what the leader did, and it's so weird how in the church we've twisted this, and follow Jesus is a different game. You don't really have to flap your wings. You don't have to accent. You can just sit there and do it in your heart. Seriously. You know, when I read the scriptures, says, man, whoever claims to, to, to know him must, must walk as Jesus walked. But we go, well, no, I'm doing that in my heart. You're like the kid sitting on the recliner going, no, I'm flapping my wings in my heart. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's, 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 it, we, we distort things because of what we want. You know, remember, remember Simon says? That was easy, right? Simon says, pat your head. But Jesus says it's a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you, you, you just have to memorize it. That's what we do in the church. If Jesus said, you just got to study it. You, you, just gotta, you, you just have to be able to quote it in the Greek. You, you just, it's, 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 it has nothing to do with, hey, Jesus says. You, look, look, when my daughter you know, comes to me and I go, look, go clean your room. She knows better than to come back a few hours later and goes, dad. I memorized what you said. <clears throat> I can say it in Greek. In fact, some of my friends, we're gonna, they're going to come over and we're going to do a little study on what it would look like to clean my room. It just, it's not making sense to me. And, and all I can say is that we're twisting things. We do, we do in the church and we, we create this little way where we don't actually have to do what Jesus called. You see that? Because I tell you what, I see it all the time. I had a very close friend that uh, for a while was getting involved in BSF, which if you don't know is a sophisticated high-end Bible study over in Annapolis. And it'd be a hundred men that would get together. And after a while, they were invited to get involved in leadership. So what do you think? I said, I think you ought to leave and you ought to leave fast. Because it doesn't do anything to sit in a room full of fat fish that just feed the head. When God has called us and made clear what it is we're to do, we need to stop memorizing what he said. We need to stop studying the essence of what he said and, and learning how to parse the Greek verbs on what he said. And we need to start doing what he said. Start being who he said. And not be ashamed of it, because as we saw, and as you will see, to be who Christ has called you to be will cost you. Praise God it will cost you. And everything that comes out of you, chances are it's like a barnacle on your boat. It needed to come off. It was drag. It was slowing you down. When you testify, are you ashamed of the call for obedience? Do you tell people, that what it is to be a disciple of God is to love him first and foremost, above everything else, as he has said. 
Do you talk about a call to be a doulos, that to be a Christian, a true biblical Christian, not a Sunday morning, oh, I know where they hang out and we, we do brunch together after church. No, I'm talking about the Jesus-loving Christianity of the Bible. Do you tell people that it's a call to slavehood, to be a doulos for Christ, a blessed slave? Do you talk about the call and the requirement to be crucified to self? Galatians 2.20. I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I daily am crucified. Romans 6, 6, same thing. Do you talk to them about what it is to carry your cross? If there's somebody who's very active in doing a lot of religious stuff, do you say it's not what you do, it's who you are? Or are you ashamed because that will cost you? I can tell you, I've, I've had a lot of relationships end because of Jesus. I don't know how else to put it. But I also know that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with a number of people because of Jesus. And as much as I like you, I don't really care so much how much time we spend together here. It's whether or not we're going to be together in eternity. And if you love somebody, don't be ashamed of the truth that will set them free. That's the message that Paul is giving to Timothy. He says, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. I find personal joy in that piece. I pray that when you're explaining your pastor that you're not ashamed of me. I promise I may not make your relationships easy, but my heart is there. And I'm trying to equip you that not only will you get home, but that you'll bring others with you as you share truth and love, and you're inspired and, if need be, challenged to get off the couch and into the game. Get out of the study in the library. Stop memorizing and start living. Paul says, don't be embarrassed. Please, don't be ashamed of me. But join with me in suffering for the gospel. Perhaps the greatest struggle, the toughest verse maybe in all of Scripture Come and join me in suffering for the gospel. How about we put that out on the marquee? Can you imagine the traffic jam we'd have of everybody coming in? Learn how to suffer for Christ here today. Nobody wants that, and yet that's the road to heaven. That's the call of a disciple. To be a slave that says, Lord, use me, pour me out. I am ready to say no matter what. Opening verses of James. Consider it pure joy when you are persecuted for Christ. See, that doesn't make sense, Pastor Jeff. What do you mean? I mean that when you have been set free, the things of this world, including your flesh, no longer carry the value they don't have the taste that your taste buds once had. Now, suffering is not the kind of bait that most churches will put on the hook to try to bring people in. They stay away from it. Consequently, there tends to be a tremendous misunderstanding about suffering in the church. And here again, I've brought another friend with me. Mark Driscoll has done a great job of taking a look at the top 10 misunderstandings about biblical suffering. And I want us to learn this in a way that sticks with us, that you can share with others. And so I'm going to have him take some time now and walk us through the misconceptions of suffering. Because as you'll see before we're done, those who get to be used of God in a way that brings persecution and trial are the blessed people. The blessed people. But take a look at this and tell me if you can't relate. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you're in the midst of it. Maybe somebody else is telling you these things. The top 10 misconceptions about biblical suffering. Note the graphic. A lot of sick pulpits. There are innumerable examples of bad teaching. I'll give you ten ways in which the doctrine of suffering is mistaught, thereby corrupting your instinct to use it for a witness. First, 
Suffering is not avoided by you having a lot of faith. There is something called faith teaching, which is actually faithless teaching. It is unfaithful teaching, which says, if you have enough faith, you won't get sick and you won't be broke. You'll be healthy and wealthy. The logical conclusion is that if someone is suffering as a Christian, we should not comfort them, we should rebuke them because they are in sin, and if they had enough faith, they would be rich and healthy. Yet we see in Scripture, there are people who have great faith in God, like Job, Paul, and Jesus Christ, who is God himself. And they suffer. They also experience poverty, hardship, loneliness, and they weep. The sickest example I can give you from my own experience was a pastor that I knew of who taught, if you have enough faith, you will not get sick and you will be healthy. Until his wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he was left with a dilemma, should I change my theology, which is wrong, and comfort my wife? Or will I hold to my erroneous theology and rebuke her for her cancer? And I grievously report to you that that man publicly rebuked his own wife for not having enough faith to beat cancer as she was dying. That is demonic. Number two, suffering does not automatically make you a victim. My fear is when I teach on suffering, all who have or are suffering will simply declare, I am suffering, therefore I'm like Jesus. No, you're not. (laughs) Jesus was without sin. You and I, we have tons of sin. And sometimes we suffer because of our sin. If you disrespect your boss, you will suffer unemployment. (laughs) If you're cruel to your spouse, you will suffer divorce. If you eat and drink too much, you will suffer physical ailment. And in those moments, you can't say, I'm like Jesus. You can't. You must say, I've sinned and I've reaped what I've sown. Three, suffering is not necessarily a punishment for a sin. God can't discipline his people and punish non-Christians for sin, but there is not always a correlation between suffering and a sin. There is an example in the Bible where a man is born blind. And some followers of Jesus ask him, is he blind because of his parents' sin or his sin? Jesus says, neither. He is blind that the glory of God might be revealed in him. God is doing something altogether different with that man. And his suffering is purposeful, not purposeless, but it's not the consequence of anyone's sin. Fourth, suffering is not to be pursued the early church had some erroneous teaching where probably well-meaning Christians realized suffering purifies us and identifies us with Jesus. Therefore, they tried to suffer. They pursued suffering. Some of you do. You deny yourself godly pleasure. You deny yourself any sort of fun or joy. When there is a conflict or a difficulty, you insert yourself that you might have something that is painful so that you might use it to be sanctified. And while it looks holy, it's unholy, it's pride, which says, I do not trust God to bring into my life his divine appointments of suffering, therefore I will help him by pursuing my own. We would not encourage anyone to pursue suffering. What we are saying is, when it comes, either from the hand of God or through the hand of God, when it comes, suffer well. Suffer well. Fifth, suffering is not to be avoided at all costs. Some of you make your decisions based upon what will be the path of least resistance. What will cause the least conflict, least pain, least friction, least hardship, least suffering? Then that's what I'll do. And sometimes God calls us to hardship. Sometimes God calls us to pain. Sometimes God calls us to suffering. And had Jesus chosen the path without suffering, we would be dead in our sins and he would not have left the comforts of heaven to come into the suffering of the earth. 
One author says it well. He says, I would rather have a bumpy ride to heaven than a smooth ride to hell. And I think he's right. Number six. Suffering is not to be excused because God uses it. I hear some Christians who are unrepentant, they will sin and then God uses it for something good and they say, well, I know it wasn't that great, but God used it, so it must be okay with God. I'll give you one example. I was having a terse dialogue with a father who literally growing up beat his sons. And he said, well, they grew up to be good boys and they're strong and they're masculine and they have dignity and they have courage and they have toughness. So, you know, the beating wasn't a bad thing. I said, that is a testimony to the goodness of God the Father, not to you as their father. That you were a wicked, evil, sinful man who did an atrocious thing in beating his sons. And if you don't repent of that, you will go to hell because unrepentant people go to hell and you are a man who's living an unrepentant life of all of your sin, and you keep making stupid theological arguments like, well, God used it, so he must think it was fine. Just because God uses something, that doesn't justify the sin. That means that God is good even when we are bad, but that does not justify our evil. Seven, suffering is no excuse to passively allow injustice and evil. I've heard some people say, I know they're doing wrong and I know they're doing evil, but God is using it to teach me good things. So I praise God for it. No, you must also resist evil, pursue justice. I had this conversation with a wife whose husband was beating her. I said, what in the world are you doing remaining with a man who beats you and your children? She said, but God is teaching me so much through this and I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus. I said, well, praise be to God and be sanctified, but call the police. Have him arrested and thrown in jail. He too needs to be sanctified, not just you. We cannot allow people to continually sin in the name of our sanctification. We also must confront them and rebuke them and when necessary, take legal recourse. Eight, suffering is for us not an act of atonement, but an act of sanctification. God is not making us pay him back for our sin. When we sin, God is not making us come good on our debt. And some of you, I fear when you suffer, you think, okay, God is beating me now because I have sinned, and that's okay. If God beats me enough, maybe he will then love me. No. Jesus died for your sin. He's been punished in your place. God is not making you pay him back. We don't believe in karma. We don't believe in penance. We don't believe in purgatory. We believe in Jesus. Nine. Suffering is not to be fully understood in this life. I have read a large stack of books on suffering and evil over the years, philosophical and theological in nature. And what I will tell you is this, there are many aspects of suffering and particular illustrations of human beings' lives that encountered much suffering that I simply will not answer because I have no answer. Other than to say God is good and I trust him. And when the Bible says that we know in part and we see in part, that's true. And that when we see Jesus, it'll all make sense. That's true. When Paul asks elsewhere his rhetorical question, who has known the mind of the Lord? He's not expecting any of us to raise our hand. But to simply say, not I. There are things that you will not understand regarding even your personal suffering until you see the face of Jesus. And 10th, Suffering is not beyond the goodness of a sovereign God. Suffering is not beyond the goodness of a sovereign God. That God ultimately uses everything. That God ultimately works through everything. That God takes even that which is horrendous and eventually because of his goodness and sovereign power uses it for beauty. We believe that, and if we cease to believe that, we lose all hope. Romans 8.28, Paul says it this way. 
We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In all things, God eventually works it out for his redemptive good. There's an illustration of this in Genesis 50, 20, where Joseph, looking at his brothers who sought to destroy him, said, what you intended for me was evil, but God used it for good and the saving of many lives. The same. Amen. It's critically important. If you're going to be invited to come suffer, which is what God's word says, come join me in suffering for the gospel. And you've been told already you ought not, dare not be ashamed of the truth that will bring the suffering upon you. And I feel it's absolutely essential that you understand what this suffering is and what it is not. Listen to what God's word says in 1 Peter 4, verses 14, 15, and 16. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Makarios. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If because you stand for Christ, you are persecuted, you are blessed. And the spirit of God rests on you. He says, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler. He says, now, I'm not talking about you getting yourself into trouble. Don't you go be a bad person and try to put your Jesus stamp on it. Because if you're suffering because you've sinned, that's not the same thing. No. But, verse 16, if it is truly because of your stand for Christ, if anyone suffers as a Christian... He is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. We've been called to not be ashamed. Listen, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. How could you be ashamed of the very truth that will set you free? The very truth. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. We're blessed in the midst of the storm. Listen as God's word continues. He's telling him, come and suffer with me for the gospel by the power of God. You can't do this on your own. It's going to require grace power, God's gift to stand in the storm. This God who has saved us and has called us to a holy life. Here again, what is your testimony? What do you testify to? That Jesus wants to give you nice, smooth, easy sailing? Or that he's called you not to be happy, but to be holy? Not to a religion, but to a relationship. Not to personal supremacy, but to sacrifice and service. Here, what Paul is telling not only young Timothy, but all of us. He goes on and he says, this grace has been given us in Christ Jesus. He said, we didn't get this because of anything we've done. No, it is by grace we have been saved through faith, not by works, lest that anyone should boast. No, this is a gift from God himself. He says, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death. Think about that. Think about that. On Calvary, he destroyed death. And if you're somebody who has thought that death is the opposite of life, let me explain to you, biblically, death is the opposite of life, but life is eternal security with Christ. Death is not the end of an existence. It is the opposite of life. It is eternally cognizant of being separated from God in a very real hell, the second death. God goes on and he says this, Jesus destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What light do you shine? What light of the gospel do you share? Are you ashamed of letting the light get too bright because people begin to squint? 
Or do you let your light shine? And are you willing to let it shine when you stand alone? Are you willing to let it shine if it costs you? Are you willing to let it shine if it brings persecution? Francis encourages us again in the midst of real life, real consequences relationally, real challenges outside the walls of a church building. I'm talking Saturday afternoon, Tuesday night, not when you're in a church setting, but when the fiery arrows of the enemy are coming and piercing through and it's costing you real life relationships, real life opportunities. Do you let your light shine no matter what? Or do you let fear overtake your faith? Is your courage diminished by cowardice? Do not be ashamed of the one who will set you free. Think about this in the context of real life. Because if all it is is a religious theory or some quiz that we know how to answer with our words but not with our walk, it does you no good. In fact, it does greater harm because you're walking in self-deceit and you're casting the wrong light upon the truth to others that may not know. Francis puts it this way. I remember when I first became a Christian, I, I still remember my very first prayer I, I said to God, whatever you do, don't let me lose my friends. Because to me, that was all that mattered to me back then was, you know, image, popularity, whatever else. But as I started studying the Bible, I realized, okay, following Jesus is going to be a lonely road. Um, and I also discovered that just by talking to my friends about him. And, and in scripture, it's so clear. It says there's this narrow road that leads to life and very few will find it. But then there's this broad and easy road that leads to destruction and, and many will enter through it. So if I want to be one of those few that find life, it's going to be difficult. And again, there's going to be very few of us. And in scripture, there's, there's so many people that in different periods of time, they had to stand alone. Like Jeremiah, he had to stand against the whole city. God told him, look, no one's going to believe your message. You're going to be completely alone. And he did it. And so you realize, okay, that's what we're up against. And I think we have to, as Christians, have uh, an eternal perspective. We have to understand how short this life is. Uh, and that's easy for me because my background, my mom died giving birth to me. My dad remarried and then my stepmom died when I was nine in a car accident. My dad got married again and then... When I was 12, he died of cancer. So by the time I was in high school, I understood, okay, this life is really short. I've got to focus on the next life. And, and it's hard to maintain that, that perspective because of the, the pressure. But one thing that really helps me is realizing that there will be no cowards in heaven. Revelation 21, when it talks about the end it talks about the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It's so clear. I, I refuse to be a coward. I don't want to be listed there as one of those that wouldn't stand up for God because earlier he says there's going to come a day when it says God will dwell with them and he will be his people. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God and he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither thou shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And that's what I want. I want to be one of those conquerors, even if that means I stand alone, because I want to be with him forever. Are you willing to stand alone? Are you willing to stand alone if that's what it takes? Are you ashamed of what his message is? Do we try to edit what he says to make it more palatable? We can't do that. 
we simply cannot do that. Paul goes on and he explains his calling to Timothy, which Timothy already knew. And I want to share it with you because this is something that we all share if you're a biblical Christian. He goes on and he says, uh, this gospel, it was for this gospel that I was appointed a herald or a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. If you've been radically transformed as a child of God, if Jesus has saved you, then you too have been called to go tell to bring truth and love to others, to go out beyond the walls of your comfort zone, maybe not to Ethiopia, but maybe to the cubicle across the office, maybe to the neighbor across the street, maybe to the 7-Eleven clerk that you see six times a week. You've been called to go. And you may not be equipped to teach in a structured way. But let me remind you, anything that you know that somebody else doesn't know, you're equipped to teach. More teaching happens through sharing and living out an example than most people want to give credit to. You see, if I acknowledge that I can be a herald, a sent one, and a teacher simply by living out my relationship, then that puts me on the hook of responsibility, makes me accountable. I would much rather go memorize, study, and put into Greek than to go live out on the streets the simple truths. And hear me, you know this, I'm not against Bible study. I'm against excuses. I'm against complacency. I'm against substitutes. Oh, the sermons we could put together with our lives if we would walk the talk. Paul finishes in verse 12 this way. He says, that is why I am suffering as I am. Why? Because I am standing for the truth. Because I am telling, I am going, and I am teaching. And remember, he's writing this from a dungeon cell where he's been told they're going to kill him very soon. And he's being tortured in the bowels of a dungeon, shackled. I thank God who I serve. And it's for this reason that I write. And he's saying, that's why I'm suffering. And that's okay. Yet I am not ashamed. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. Who do you believe? Do you believe the crowd around you or the Christ that is in you? Before you answer, let me look at your life. Because I'd, ma I'd much rather evaluate your answer through your life than through your lips. And I encourage you to do the same with me. And we're called to inspire as iron sharpens iron, God's word says. We're to call each other to the place of high service, of Christ-likeness. We saw last week that most people don't like the idea of calling out those who claim to be Christians who are not living it. God's word makes it clear. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. Go there if you didn't. We're called to the higher standard. John Piper is one of my favorite pastors and preachers. And I think in, in our day is one of those who exemplifies this understanding of what it is to be a preacher, a herald, a sent one, and a teacher. And he said in looking at what it is to be called to come suffer for the gospel and to not be ashamed, never because of who you are in Christ. He was speaking to some young people at a Bible conference, probably young college students who were thinking about or were committed to living their lives for Christ. And he talked to them about biblical suffering. And I pray we take this away with us today. For as God's word says, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him, my life 
for that day of judgment. Are you ready to suffer? Not for sport, but for the king. That the kingdom will be known and that saving souls like little Adane, are you willing to put your life on the line to sacrificially give and to go and to not be ashamed, but to stand for the king? Let John bring this to clarity for us. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Thank you for the cross, his and ours. John 16, 1, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Every radical Muslim believes that when he kills a Christian. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him so that we may be glorified with Him. I count the sufferings of this present time unworthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. It's coming. If you haven't had it yet, it's coming if you walk with Him. If you walk with Him. Philippians 1.29 For it has been granted to you that for your sake you should not only believe but suffer it's granted to you it's given to you it's a gift to you with the big bow that you will suffer second timothy 1 8 therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our lord or me his prisoner but share in suffering for the gospel for the power of god one more acts 5 41 they left the presence of the council, Peter, John. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to be shamed for the name. The purpose of God in creating the universe is to display the greatness of the glory of His grace supremely in the suffering of his son will you join the son in displaying the supreme satisfaction of the glory of grace in joining him on the Calvary road of suffering because there's no other way the world is going to see the supreme glory of Christ today except that we break free from the Disneyland of America and begin to live lifestyles of missionary sacrifice that looks to the world like our treasure is in heaven and not on the earth. It's, it's the, the only way. way. The prosperity gospel will not make anybody praise Jesus. It will make people praise prosperity. Of course I'll have a Jesus who will give me a car who wouldn't want a Jesus who gives me health, a car, a fine marriage? I'll take your Jesus if the payoff is right. And just think about the history of missions for a moment. If you have any inkling of how we got to where we are today with 1.3 or 4 billion people professing faith in Jesus Christ when it started from 12, how did we get there? You know what the answer is? Suffering. There never has been a breakthrough into an unreached place or people without suffering. If you're going to be a missionary, mark it down. Pain. It is wonderful, I think, that Paul in this verse says, Now I rejoice in the sufferings for your sake. I'm not summoning you to a miserable life. I am summoning you to a painful life. But in this pain, all over the Bible, you find Christians rejoicing in tribulation. Rejoice in tribulation. For tribulation works patience, and patience works approvedness, and approvedness works hope, and hope will not put us to shame because the love of God is poured out in our heart. You want to experience the deep 
joy of knowing yourself loved by God. Lay out your life for another person. Take a risk with your body. Take a risk with your mind. Take a risk with your money, your schooling. What an amazing thing God calls us to do and to be. Give us a mind, oh God. Give us a mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And being found in human form, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Let this mind be in us, O oh God. Create this mind in this room right now, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Is that your perspective on biblical suffering? Do we see the privilege and the blessing that it is to stand at the crossroad of pain and suffering for Christ? Romans 12, 1 says that we are to be living sacrifices, that that is our expression of worship. And then in verse 11 it says, that we're to never lose our zeal or our fervor in spiritual service, no matter what. I am not ashamed, for I know who it is that I trust. Jesus the Christ, the one who loved me enough to go to the cross and had the power of God to come out of the tomb, proving that this is the truth that will set you free. But not if you walk in cowardice, for it is those who persevere to the end, who stand in the trench of turmoil and persecution and say, I count it a blessing to suffer for my Lord and my King. Around the end of the 19th century, at the very turn of the 20th century, in China, and some of you know that I have a heart for China, there was a rebellion that was called the Boxer Rebellion. And at that time, there was a nationalist movement within China that sought to rid their country of Christianity and foreign influence. And there became an uprising of horrific proportion. And in that uprising, Christian missionaries and Chinese Christians and many other multinational organizations that were in were sought out and they were persecuted at times to death. I want to talk to you about one small mission. At the turn of the 20th century, within China under the umbrella of the Boxer Rebellion, a mission that held about 100 Chinese Christians and they were surrounded. The mob had surrounded them, much like what you see in ethnic cleansing happening in East Africa today. But here in the midst of the Boxer Rebellion, those that were doing the persecuting stood outside that mission and said, we have surrounded the mission and there is no way out except for this one way. And they took a cross and they laid it at the door of the one way that was still available to come out. I want you to think about this, just this for a minute. To take the cross and lie it horizontal as an expression of disrespect. If you took communion with me this morning, this should bother you. In the story, as it is told, the mob said, denounce your faith. And we will let you go. As you walk out this one door, trample upon the cross, and we will let you go. Anything else, and we will kill you right here, right now. Game over. The first seven Chinese Christians, as they're called, walked out. 
and trampled this cross and they were set free. What a perverted use of that word. They went on their way. The eighth, a young lady came out. And this is what happened. She came to the door and she carefully stepped around. She got to this place. She kneeled and she prayed. No doubt for the grace that was needed for the strength that she would exhibit. Asking God's Holy Spirit to guide her. Then she stood. And she stepped over without trampling. And she was no more than half a step past when multiple bullets riddled her body and she dropped dead instantly right there. She was not ashamed, no matter what. For she knew in whom she believed and could trust and that this was not the end, but merely a doorway into eternity with the King of Kings. I ask you to embrace her courage in Christ. For you see, she was used mightily because then 92 more walked out and never touched the cross. And while their bodies littered the ground, our king was lifted up because there were people who said, I am not ashamed and I don't value what is here. I'm going home to be with my king. And so I ask you, in the midst of real life, where many of us are no doubt in the midst of some real turmoil, where I know in my family alone this week we were challenged as to whether or not we will be ashamed or we would stand, I want to ask you to champion the cross. Don't ever let it be trampled upon in your presence. Not physically or through your silence. Champion the cross. If you took communion today, you have been championed and saved. Walk with the King. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a song. Those that are going to help us with our offering, if you'll please come forward. This song was chosen intentionally because I recognize that this is a difficult message. I recognize that this is not easy. And I want you to know that there's only one way to get there. And that's through the power and the grace of God himself that the Holy Spirit will breathe on us that we would have the ability to walk with him when our flesh is not enough. It's easy when it's easy. When it's hard, it's hard. We need the Holy Spirit in us and to be working through us if we're to genuinely live a life that is not ashamed, and if we will embrace suffering no matter what. Because I tell you, my friends, it's relatively easy today. There are storms on the horizon. I can't give you the timeline, but all you have to do is read your Bible to know it's coming. Oh, that we would be a people that are ready Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege that it is to represent you in good times and in bad, on the mountaintops and especially in the valleys where you tend to do your most powerful work. Use us, Lord. Make us courageous in Christ, for there are no chumps in the church.
of Jesus Christ. Lord, grow us, I pray. Continue to pour out in us that you may be poured out through us no matter what. In Jesus' name I pray and ask that you breathe on me. Breathe on us. In Jesus' name. Amen.